Welcome to our video, The Doctrine of American Unexceptionalism. I would like tentatively to share the insights and analysis by Mr. Michael Doran, a senior fellow and director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East at Hudson Institute. He specializes in Middle East security issues. The Islamic Republic of Iran can be a real pill. Just ask the diplomats who spent the better part of a year working in Vienna to resurrect the Iran nuclear deal. By early March, they had completed the lion's share of their work, but at least one sticking point remained. Tehran was standing firm on its demand that the United States remove the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps from the State Department's list of terrorist organizations. Eager to get the deal done. President Biden began to consider complying with Tehran's demand, a process that involved consultations with skeptics, including the Israeli government, which, needless to say, was flabbergasted. Prime Minister Naftali Bennett called the move, delusional. But on March 12, the IRGC injected itself directly into the conversation, by launching an attack on Erbil, Iraq. The United States has traditionally considered lobbing ballistic missiles across international borders into civilian areas the very definition of a terrorist act. Yet Washington pretended it didn't notice. This was hardly a unique occurrence. Over the past six months, Iran has launched multiple ballistic missile and drone attacks on American allies like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia through its Houthi proxy in Yemen. It conducted a direct attack, this time through a proxy in Iraq, on American forces in Al Tanif, Syria. It hatched a plot to kidnap the Iranian American journalist, Massey Alinejad, from her home in Brooklyn. And it has actively pursued plans to assassinate former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, former Iran envoy Brian Hook, and former National Security Advisor John Bolton. In the context of the nuclear negotiations, the Biden team asked Tehran, politely, to put an end to these assassination plots. Tehran said no. Yet the Biden team has played down all these provocations, and many more. The question is why. The obvious answer is that the White House does not want to do anything to slow down or derail its effort to revive the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, as the nuclear deal is formally known. The Biden administration operates within the lines that President Obama drew when he first sold the Iran deal. There really are only two alternatives here. Either Iran getting a nuclear weapon is resolved diplomatically through negotiation, Obama said. Or it is resolved through force. Through war. But even the most cursory examination of the deal reveals that it resolves nothing. On the contrary, it permits Tehran to keep everything it needs to build a nuclear bomb. Even including, for example, the secure bunker dug deep under a mountain near Fordow. Designed to shield Iran's uranium enrichment facilities from attack, Fordow's sole purpose is military in nature. We know this with certainty thanks to the nuclear archive that the Israelis captured in a Tehran warehouse in 2018. What's more, the deal permits Tehran to make advances in its weapons program, by, for example, developing advanced centrifuges, even while its nuclear activities are still formally under international restrictions. The upshot is this, by 2031. Under the terms of this supposedly excellent deal, Iran will have a major, unfettered nuclear weapons program. America's military and economic advantages over Iran are incalculable. The United States also has allies, Israel above all. Who would be more than willing to do the hard of work of deterring Iran from advancing toward a bomb if only they were certain that America had their back? So again, we must ask, why? Why is America making moves that seem nothing less than appeasement? What makes the Biden team so eager to cut a deal that guarantees a nuclear Iran? Why has the White House placed Moscow in the catbird seat in these negotiations? Why is it treating China as a key partner in the deal?
Even as China openly proclaims its intention to overturn the American led world order? And why has Biden entirely excluded traditional allies, such as Israel and Saudi Arabia, from the negotiations? The answer to these questions lies in something Mahmoud Abazadeh Meshkini, a spokesman for the Iranian parliament's National Security and Foreign Policy Committee, recently said. In the New World Order, a triangle consisting of three powers, Iran, Russia, and China, has formed, he declared on the eve of the Ukraine war. This new arrangement heralds the end of the inequitable hegemony of the United States and the West. He's right. The Biden administration wouldn't put it that way, of course. It continues to claim that it is dedicated to preventing the rise of Iran as a nuclear weapons power and to containing Iranian forces and proxies on the ground. But the ramifications of the deal are exactly as Abazadeh Meshkini says, the undermining of American power. In the White House, however, the president and his advisors prefer to think of it as the heralding of a world based on multilateral partnership between Beijing, Moscow, and Tehran. Indeed, at its deepest level, the Iran nuclear deal is an instrument for rejecting American exceptionalism, the notion that the United States is uniquely poised by history and geography to exercise leadership on the international stage, and for ushering in a post-American global order. It is only through understanding this worldview that it is possible to understand America's confounding and seemingly contradictory moves on the world stage. I've come to think of it as reverse American exceptionalism. Perhaps the cleanest articulation of this worldview came in 2009, from the mouth of Barack Obama when he refused to endorse a traditional understanding of the concept of American exceptionalism. I believe in American exceptionalism just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism, he said. That was the provocative sentence that drove headlines. But equally important was what Obama said next. America's leadership role, he insisted depends on our ability to create partnerships. That's because, he said, America can't solve problems alone. The Iran deal was a direct outgrowth of this perspective. Obama dreamed. He told David Remnick of The New Yorker in 2014, of, an equilibrium, between the Gulf states and Iran in which, there's competition, perhaps suspicion. But not an active or proxy warfare. This dream was not entirely fanciful, the search for regional stability is indeed the job of America. But Obama's route to achieving it was loopy. The problem, in his eyes, were America's allies. Israel and Saudi Arabia's maximalist agendas were hastening conflict, launching the United States into an unnecessary confrontation with Iran. Thus, the goal of American policy should be to moderate both the Iranians and traditional American allies by accommodating Tehran. Joe Biden, as vice president, strongly endorsed Obama's view. Our biggest problem is our allies, Biden said in October 2014, lamenting the opposition of America's allies to Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad, Iran's closest friend. As president, Biden has placed former Obama staffers in key positions, men who, like their mentor, believe that stability will come only after the United States reigns in its allies. Thus proving to Tehran that it can best solve its security dilemmas in concert with Washington. Just listen to Robert Malley, who was responsible for Middle East policy in the Obama White House and is now the special envoy for Iran in the State Department. In 2020, he wrote, admiringly, that Obama's ultimate goal was to help the Middle East find a more stable balance of power that would make it less dependent on direct U.S. interference or protection. Or here's Jake Sullivan, Biden's national security adviser. The goal, he wrote in May 2020, is to be less ambitious militarily in the Middle East, but more ambitious in using U.S. 
leverage in diplomacy to press for a de-escalation in tensions and eventually a new modus vivendi among the key regional actors. In other words, the path to establishing equilibrium is to court the Iranian regime, not to crush it. The Obama-Biden doctrine is no mere downsizing or right-sizing of America's role in the Middle East. The United States could, for example, pull back militarily while demanding that allies do more to confront Iran. This doctrine of American unexceptionalism, however, is opposed to the very idea of the balance of power as we have understood it since ancient times. Democrats believe that, as a result of the end of the Cold War and the advent of a globalized and digitally networked world, humanity has transitioned to a more advanced stage in history. We have somehow migrated beyond the time-honored truths of Thucydides, Machiavelli, Metternich, Kissinger, et al. In such conditions, to adopt a traditional balance of power approach is not simply unnecessary. It is positively self-defeating. End of history, assumptions, that a multipolar world is inevitable and that free trade and capitalism combine to form a powerful asset that will dissolve both state interest and nationalist. Particularism, have a long American pedigree.